everyone, Ryan Young, Kama Jiu Jitsu, and I hope you're all doing well. And I hope your journeys are safe and fun. Anyway, today what I wanted to cover was belt testing. Now, as many of you know, belt testing is not something that we do here at Kama Jiu Jitsu, at least not formally. We, we, we're always testing our students, but it's never really formal. Uh, actually, come to think of it, there was one session that we had that was actually formal. The student didn't know. Uh, in fact, you might have, uh, if you saw our video that I did with two of my students, Zach and David, uh, both of our purple belts uh, here, here in Texas, and Zach was actually formally tested. Well, he didn't know he was. We had him come over to the house. Dave happened to be in town. Zach doesn't live that far from me. Gave him a quick text and said, hey, uh, what are you doing? Uh, why don't you come over to the house? So he came over and when he got here, chit chatted a little Professor Dave, have him put a gi on, didn't even have a belt. He, he, do, he did the test, not in his blue belt, but in the white belt because he didn't know he was coming to train. Took him upstairs to the mat and uh, we had Greg, who's one of our assistant instructors from California who happened to be in town and he was Zach's training dummy. Professor Dave then spent the next hour going through various things. Okay, do this, do this. All right, let me see this, let me see that. Mentally checking off all the boxes that Zach had achieved everything that Dave is looking for. After that one hour was done, Professor Dave looks at me and goes, which means he passed. So Zach then got his purple belt. So Zach was formally tested. All of our other students though, it's kind of worked out that way. Dave happened to be here and I happened to to, to wanted to, to get Zach in front of Dave so Dave could evaluate him uh, to confirm what I had already believed in my mind. After talking with a lot of friends of mine who see the videos, you know, they're also subscribers to the channel and they tell you, you know, Ryan, um, let's kind of talk a little bit about this, uh, about your whole being anti-belt testing. And I think they've put some good points in front of me. For one thing, we've always been a small school. So when you have a small school, you know all your students' jujitsu games pretty intimately. You know, at least I do, Dave does, what everybody is good and weak at. And when we have a moment, we set some time aside and tell them, hey, we need to have you work on this, okay? Do this, this, this. And, and as time goes on, being that they're all group classes, you know, we do have some students who do private classes. And when they do a private session, then it's easy to fill in gaps and make sure that the students don't have any holes. Um, and then what they do is they go to a group class and they'll reinforce what they did in the private the week prior. So in that way, it's easy, whether they're private only or group and private. But when they're group only students, it becomes a, it becomes a challenge, especially as the classes get larger. So I have a lot of friends who have students, numbers of students much larger than Kama Jiu Jitsu. And they say, for the ones that don't, they say it's very difficult for them to be able to keep up with all their students and to know how good they are. So what they have to do then is they have to then go to the timeline schedule where they look on their management system and they see, okay, so-and-so student has been here 50 times. Okay, it's time to give him a stripe on his belt. They don't know what he knows and what he doesn't know. They just know he's been to 50 classes, right? But they're so busy that they can't possibly keep up with every single student. Now, when you have 200 students, how are you gonna do that? It's tough. Other black belts that I speak to, they say, well, the solution to that is you want everybody to have the same abilities, meaning have the same techniques down before you move them on. And that's what we do. That's what we've always done. We have a curriculum and they have to meet the curriculum, the requirements of the curriculum and have to be able to execute. If they don't execute, then they wait. I have noticed that as the school has gotten larger, especially out here in Texas, the times to get from one belt to another belt or to go up a level has increased. I don't know if it's because the early members would come more often and more regularly than the current members, or if it's because we just have a lot more members now. That's something we're kind of evaluating, which I guess makes, uh, makes it the reason why we're now more open to the possibility of having belt testing. But the problem is, you know, and this is something I've always kind of wondered about, and you know, I'd even kind of mock it to tell you the truth. So I'm gonna have a certain day. So on, Friday of this, e this week, Friday evening, I'm gonna have belt testing. So you, 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 let's say 10 of you, okay? I want you to come over to class Friday night and we're gonna do belt testing. Well, being that it's a time that's not regularly scheduled, being that it's time that I'm not usually teaching, do I do it for free or do I charge them? Because that would mean that to do something, let's say on a Friday night, when I'm not normally in the, in the academy, 
then that's the night I would take my family out, for instance. So it's going to cost me that time. And the same thing's going to happen for the members. You know, they're going to have to change their schedule as well. Do we set up a time that I actually go and test them and then have to charge them for it? So I ask these questions of, of these friends of mine, these black belt friends of mine, and they say, well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's what we do. Okay, so then my question is, okay, what if they don't attend the testing? Then they don't get their promotion. And it makes sense when they put it to me that way. And the reason is because on the one hand, you know, if I know somebody should be at a certain level, you know, I know in my heart, I train with them, I watch them train, I've helped them, and I know that they've checked all the boxes. Am I gonna make them come to testing and pay the fee? I don't know. I don't really feel that I would, that's not something I would wanna do, right? Because I already know the answer to the question, but I'll do it. Today, I just give them the belt. But in a system where it's systematized, which is what we're doing, we're trying to do with jujitsu, to make it to where you don't have two people that are five years into the art, both blue belts, but yet don't know the same things, right? We can't have that, right? Because when you have that, that's when you start to see the decline of your school's overall jujitsu. And that's where it gets to be where people go, well, you know, I can't play guard, at least not very well. So I'm gonna start watching YouTube and I'm gonna start learning guard from somebody else. Well, if you keep doing that, what happens is your jujitsu ends up not being your jujitsu anymore. It ends up being a conglomeration of jujitsu. Now for some schools, that's fine. That's, that's really what they are. But for us, and maybe for you, or maybe for your professor, that's not the case. You have a certain style. There's a way you want all your students to do it and you don't want them doing it a different way. So in that case, you have your curriculum and you have your standards, right? There may be 20 different ways to do an armbar, but you want your students to do it one particular way. As they get up into the upper belt ranks, then have at it, play around, experiment, but when it comes down to it, you will do it this way and you will do it this way all the time. So that's the reason why you would want to have belt testing. A lot of my best friends, that I get a lot of back and forth from are black belts under Grandmaster Helson. Why is that? Well, Hickson doesn't have a lot of black belts. He just doesn't. For whatever reason, it was a challenge to get a black belt. So, you know, there aren't that many Hickson, as I say, true Hickson black belts running around. There are a lot of people who got put on a black belt by Hickson Gracie, but as far as the ones that were in his academy, training with, training with him, getting the, the, the benefit of the daily Hickson, there aren't that many. Um, on the other hand, Helson had a lot of black belts that he spent a lot of time with. Being that I've got a lot of friends that are Helson black belts, I'll see a lot of happenings that go on. So what Helson does, and I've known this for years now, what he does is for his black belts, he tests them. For every time they're up for a degree, they have to undergo a belt test. What it is, it's you buy an hour of Helson's time. It costs, it, it costs you $250. You need to go over, for Helson at least, the self-defense curriculum, the entire self-defense curriculum every time you're up for a degree. It's known. It's not anything that's unknown. Now there may have been changes, updates that Helson would have and he'll give it to them. But you're taking his time. So at, in fact, I think it's probably a day or two that he will just meet and his black belts will fly in and he will test them. And he will make sure that they know it. If you don't know it, it doesn't matter that you spent the money. If you forgot in the last two years since your last degree, you forgot all the gun defenses that he likes, for example. I don't think he'll pass, I don't know. So, as a result, the black belts get together and they study together weeks ahead of time. Weeks ahead of time. And they will make sure that they all have it down because number one, they want the promotion that they, they worked so hard uh, to earn. And number two, it costs them money to test with the Grandmaster and if they fail, then they're gonna have to wait till two years from now. And, and he will fail you. Now, Grandmaster Hickson did kind of experiment with testing a while back. I remember this. And in fact, he did it semi-regularly. I don't know. Uh, but I know Professor Fernando, one of our, one of Dave's uh, black belts, he was tested, I don't know if it was for his black belt or for his brown belt, one of the two. And Hickson tested three of them. And the total time was eight hours, eight hours. Hickson had so many things that he required of them to, that he required of the students to know that it took eight hours. And even at that point, Hickson was kind of exasperated because the technical abilities weren't perfect because as we all know, Grandmaster Hickson 
his mind is always going. It's going, it's going, it's going. He's always looking to improve something. And if the way you do your arm bar today is the way he did it 10 years ago, he's already improved it several times by then. So in his mind, he's thinking, okay, I want you to do it this newest, latest way. The way you're doing it, it's a 10 year old way and he's tempted to not pass you. And in fact, I think Dave was telling me that um, at the end of that eight hour session, when I say he was exasperated, he was, I think he, he said uh, something to the effect, you didn't pass, uh, you sort of passed and you passed, right? Even with the best one of the three, which was Professor Fernando, he wasn't super happy, but he did take the time out to do it. Now, being that it takes him, it took him eight hours, you have to expect that if your professor has to take that kind of time to test you, that there has to be some kind of compensation involved. I have no idea what Hickson charged for that session. I don't think he thought it would go eight hours, uh, but you know, he, he kept on until it was done. So it went all day. So I talked to other professors and some of them will make an event out of it, but you do have to pay for the belt testing. And you know, judo schools, you know, they'll do it as well. They'll, they'll, they'll charge their students. You know, when, when my, when me and my son were in judo together, uh, every two months we had belt testing and not everybody was up for it. Some of us were, some of us weren't. There was a cost to it and it would be a formal type thing. And there would be at least three senseis that were evaluating and there might be 20, 30 people that were testing. And it just got all banged out in one particular day. So there I am about this whole testing. So if you have anything that you think would be good to add to this argument, comment below because it's something that as the school goal gets larger, if you want to maintain consistent standards, you have to, I'm starting to think now, you have to test. Or you, have to, you have to have some kind of way to do it. If you don't have instructors up the yin yang, where you have say one instructor for every five students that can take charge of five students and be responsible for them, then you know in that case, you don't need to do any belt testing. But if you have one black belt and a hundred students, then there has to be some way to get it done in an efficient manner, at the same time, allowing you to maintain the standards as you grow older, or not as you grow larger. Because other than that, if you can't maintain standards, then there's no reason to have a large school really because you're not you, you've gotten past the point at which you can evaluate now if we think of just ordinary school it doesn't matter if your school is a small school or if it's a, a high school that has a thousand graduating seniors you're going to have tests now of course you say well though they don't charge they don't charge in school for for tests well yeah they do you know here in texas we pay property taxes and our property taxes Two and a half percent of the value of your house, 1.5%, so more than half of that goes to the local school district. You know, teachers don't work for free. Schools don't operate for nothing. We all pay for it through our taxes. When my friends are, are telling me, look, you know, a school, a jujitsu school is an entity that needs to survive. Um, and it all comes down to time. If somebody's not getting compensated for their time, then they're not going to do it. Simple as that. And that's true. So if you're going to have a black belt that's going to be evaluating members and the members want to be want to feel that they've earned their rank you have to do some sort of testing anyway any, any kind of comments you can put in there how your school does it uh, if you're a black belt or you run a school say so and tell us how you do it we'd love to hear from you anyway i hope your training is going well and i hope you're being safe we'll talk to you soon until next time take care bye-bye